Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone to lecture number 46 which is the third part of microbial metabolism in module 9. We're going to look at uh, the electron transport chain and how the uh, three different biochemical pathways you can call them three or two respiration and fermentation and within that you within respiration you have aerobic and anaerobic respiration so we'll take a look at those uh, pathways and how they are uh, how they happen within the prokaryotic cell. Let's go through some details about glycolysis. So here we have the glycolysis pathway and we start with our favorite starting compound that is glucose. So we have glucose to begin with, C6 to begin with, 1 ATP is lost and 1 phosphate is attached to the glucose molecule. So this is your glucose 6 phosphate. So at the expense of 1 ATP that gets converted to ADP and you get glucose 6 phosphate. So it's a low energy phosphate bond and this is then rearranged. You get the isomeric form to get fructose 6 phosphate. This fructose 6 phosphate is then converted to a diphosphate, which means phosphate is attached at both ends of the C6 molecule. So one more ATP is utilized and you get fructose 1,6-diphosphate. This fructose 1,6-diphosphate is then cleaved into two C3 compounds. So I say C6 to begin with and now we have two compounds that have been broken into. Now they're each step of these reactions is mediated by a specific enzyme. We are not interested in that level of um, detail, but if you are interested, you can refer to the textbook. So here we have C6 going to C3 compounds. We have two C3 compounds, dihydroxy acetone phosphate DHAP and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or GP. Now these two are interchangeable compounds. So assuming that GP, uh, G3P or GP uh, is dominant, we then go to the next step. Uh, I think uh, GP dominates uh, in solution and uh, yes, so DHAP is readily converted to GP and the next enzyme will convert whatever GP is formed to the next uh, compound. This compound is diphosphoglyceric acid. So two things happen over here. NAD plus is converted to NADH and a phosphate. Two phosphates are utilized. So each of these C3 compounds which had only one phosphate now have two phosphates each. Okay. So now we have two of the C3 molecules, two of these C3 molecules, each one of them has two phosphates. Utilizing two ADP, these phosphates from 1,3-diphosphoglyceric acid is transferred to two ADP molecules. So they become two ATP and you then get three phosphoglyceric acid. So two phosphates have been transferred to ADP in high energy bonds along with NADH being formed. There is a rearrangement of the uh, compound with 2-phosphoglyceric acid being formed and water is being generated and in the final step we have phosphoenol pyruvic acid uh, PEP which is a very important key intermediate in this entire cycle and again ADP two more ADPs are used phosphate from phosphoenol pyruvic acid is transferred to ADP and pyruvic acid is generated. So pyruvic acid is a C3 compound, two of them are formed and in the entire process two ATPs were invested, four were obtained so there is a net gain of two ATPs and 
2 NADH are also gained. So that's another gain. And when these two NADH enter the electron transport chain, they each NADH will result in three ATPs. So there is a net gain of eight ATPs. So uh, that's what you see over here. It's the same entire reaction. Each step is described in these two slides. So the overall glycolysis reaction for us is one glucose will give you two pyruvic acids, two NADH and two ATP. That's the net accounting of the entire uh, reaction or you can call it um, at the end of the glycolysis reaction. And don't forget that one NADH gives you three ATP and if you have FADH that will give you two ATP and this is very important in the next step. Uh, so here we have what is called uh, the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Uh, so various terms are used to describe this uh, very crucial method of oxidizing a C3 compound. So here we have the beginning of the cycle. It starts with C3 which is the pyruvic acid. This pyruvic acid is converted into a key intermediate within the cycle. So one carbon dioxide is lost over here. One of the carbons in pyruvic acid is converted to CO2. It combines, the C2 that is left combines with coenzyme A, so you get acetyl-CoA. Now for the first step, NAD plus is converted to NADH and one of the uh, CO2s is released. Now this acetyl-CoA, as, as I said, it enters into this cyclic um, set of reactions which have several key intermediates. So you have acetyl-CoA, CoA is released. It's a coenzyme, so it has to be released without doing anything. This acetyl group, the C2 group, will attach itself to oxaloacetic acid, which is the last step of the cycle. So this C4, which was the last intermediate in this cycle, will attach itself to the acetyl group and coenzyme A is released. This citric acid, which is a C6 compound, will then be rearranged to form isocitric acid. This isocitric acid will again lose one carbon. In the process, NAD plus is converted to NADH. You get alpha ketoglutaric acid. Alpha ketoglutaric acid is a C5 compound. It then loses another carbon dioxide and is converted to succinyl CoA when a coenzyme, again coenzyme A, attaches itself to this compound to form succinyl CoA. And in the process, CO2 is lost and NAD plus is converted to NADH. Now, this succinyl CoA is going to uh, utilize ADP plus another phosphate to generate ADP and coenzyme A is released back into solution. So this succinyl-CoA is now succinic acid. ATP has been formed. These are high energy bonds. So um, in, in the next step, FAD plus is utilized. It's converted to FADH. That's converted, to, so succinic acid is converted to fumaric acid and fumaric acid goes to malic acid. Malic acid is converted to ox oxaloacetic acid. These are all C4 compounds, so they are all isomers of the same thing. Uh, so we have NAD plus being converted to NADH. Oxaloacetic acid is the last compound in Krebs cycle and this entire cycle continues as long as uh, acetyl-CoA keeps entering the Krebs cycle. So this is all of it. And from our point of view, what is important? Something that we need to all remember is what are the key intermediates? So you know all the key intermediates and the fact that a C3 compound has been converted to three carbon dioxide molecules and in the process, one ATP per pyruvic acid so here is the full account. So we have glycolysis. We've already accounted for eight ATP. In the preparatory step of the Krebs cycle where pyruvic acid is converted to acetyl-CoA, 
what did we get? We got one NADH. Now every NADH is equivalent to um, three ATPs. So for our starting compound of glucose, we have to multiply three is for one pyruvic acid. So six is for two pyruvic acid compound. So here we have 6 ATP. Then it enters the Krebs cycle where you get 2 GTP which are the equivalent of ATP. This is substrate level phosphorylation. Let's just take a look at it again. So here we have the substrate level phosphorylation where succinyl CoA goes to succinic acid and you get a generation of ATP. So that is 2 ATP here. Then you get production of 6 NADH for every glucose molecule, 3 NADH for pyruvic acid and 6 for glucose. So these 6 NADH have to be multiplied by 3. So you get 18 ATP from oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain. And finally, 2 FADH give you 2 ATP. So each FADH gives you uh, 2 ATP. So 2 FADH will give you 4 ATP. Again, that enters the electron transport chain and you get that by oxidative phosphorylation. So at the end of the entire process, CO2, a C6 molecule has been converted to 6 CO2 and 38 ATP have been generated. So this is the aerobic respiration pathway with oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor. Now this is the maximum that nature has been able to do with the best possible a redox couple. So the redox couple of glucose plus oxygen is the highest energy yield and 38 ATP is what is obtained. This is uh, about the cat catabolism of glucose. Now what about all the other types of compounds? So what we just saw is carbohydrates and that's a sugar. Glucose is a sugar that we saw complete conversion about uh, of. All right. So let's come to uh, the catabolism of organic molecules. So we have looked at the catabolism of glucose going to 6 CO2. So that is what you see in the center of this figure. What about the other macromolecules? What happens to proteins, lipids? So proteins have to be broken down into their monomeric units of amino acids. These amino acids can become part of the glycolysis step or they can enter the Krebs cycle and from there into the electron transport chain. So this is one uh, method. Then you have lipids, they get converted. The, remember the lipids are glycerols attached to fatty acids. So the splitting of glycerol molecules and fatty acids is the first step. And these glycerols can enter at the glycolysis step. The fatty acids can enter at the Krebs cycle. So these are some of the points at which other organic molecules can get uh, broken down into uh, other intermediates or converted to CO2. So let's first do a look at the electron transport carriers. I already mentioned in a previous topic that this is your plasma membrane and you have, so here are your hydrophilic portions, you have your hydrophobic portion and you have the remaining hydrophilic portion of the, uh, the phospholipid bilayer membranes, okay. Now there are several membrane spanning proteins that are a part of the electron transport chain. So this is, this part of the bottom part of this layer faces the cytoplasm. So you have your periplasmic space. Now you have a membrane associated uh, electron carriers. So the first thing that's going to happen is, let's say you have, the, uh, let me also back up here and say that there are three complexes that are shown in the textbook and we're following uh, the textbook by Tortora, Funk and Case. So they've gone with three uh, complexes, so I'm sticking to that. There are other sources in the literature which show four complexes. Either way, uh, the endpoints remain the same. There are no major differences. So here we have our three major complexes. 
and uh, we have membrane associated electron carriers which are accepting electrons from the donor and transferring them to the acceptor. So in the first case we have NADH. Now NADH is going to give up a hydrogen atom. So one proton and one electron are going to pass from NADH into FMN which is the first complex and here the protons are being pumped out of the cell. So a proton motive force is being generated. So the concentration of protons outside the cell is going to be higher than the concentration of protons from uh, the inside of the membrane are being pumped out of the cytoplasm. These protons are going to be transferred along with electrons. So the red line represents electrons and the blue line represents protons. So these electrons are not going to be pumped out. Instead, they are going to be passed from one complex to another through the, elect uh, through the plasma membrane, through these complexes which are associated with the plasma membrane and eventually uh, these electrons will be transferred at this end point to our terminal electron acceptor. So our terminal electron acceptor can be oxygen. That oxygen gas will uh, accept these electrons and convert to water or you can have carbonate, nitrate, sulfate and so on. So all that will happen at the last point. So here we have our membrane associated complexes. So you have complex 1, complex 2 and complex 3. So complex 1 is NADH dehydrogenase complex, complex 2 is cytochrome BC1 complex and the last one is cytochrome oxidase complex. Now out of these, as the electrons are picked up by the terminal electron acceptor, in the last part of the entire process, the proton motive force, remember in all three cases, in all three complexes, protons are being pumped out. These protons will then be utilized in the ATP synthesis process. So at this end, at the inner side, inside the cytoplasm, ADP, adenosine diphosphate, will pick up one more phosphate, utilizing the proton motive force that already exists across the membrane and this protein or enzyme ATP synthase will generate ATP molecules. So this is how NADH along, first NADH is involved with generating the proton motive force. This proton motive force is then utilized for generating ATP. And we already went through the fact that one NADH molecule will give you three ATP and one FADH molecule will give you two ATP. So these are some of the things that you need to remember to understand how energy is generated during the electron transport process. So this, these membrane associated electron carriers will conserve the energy released by helping in the synthesis of ATP. These are oxidation reduction enzymes, NADH dehydrogenase is transferring the entire hydrogen atom from NADH to, uh, so you have a split between the protons and the electrons. The electrons are transferred from one complex to the other and the protons are pumped out of the cell. Then you have the flavor proteins or FAD. They contain riboflavin and they are also oxidation reduction uh, enzymes, iron sulfur proteins and cytochromes. All of them contain uh, heme groups or uh, other methods of um, transferring electrons. So we will take a look at some of them. And then we come to non-protein electron carriers. The non-protein electron carriers are quinones. These quinones are not attached to the membrane. They are freely diffusible through the membrane. They can transfer electrons from the iron sulfur proteins to the cytochromes. And um, they can also transfer both protons as well as electrons. So let's see if we can take a closer look at some of them. Uh, I've already mentioned that flavor proteins are proteins that are derivatives of riboflavin, which is vitamin B2. And they are capable of accepting and donating both protons as well as electrons. And you, I would refer you to the textbook. Any of the textbooks will give you the structure of flavor proteins. And then we come to cytochromes. Now cytochromes, as I said, are iron-containing 
porphyrin rings. I think in a previous topic I've already shown this. So here you have iron 2 plus at the center of a porphyrin ring which is a large organic molecule and it is bound by nitrogen atoms. So you can see it in pictorial form. Here is our iron and it's bound by the nitrogens in blue and the gray colors are for the carbon the hydrocarbon part now these cytochromes can accept and donate electrons only they do not transfer protons so if i refer back again to this so here is the cyto uh, these are the quinones and these are the cytochrome pools so you can see that some of them are involved in proton in pumping out the protons and in other cases uh, just the electrons are passed from one complex to another. Uh, so I already mentioned that we have quinones which are also called coenzymes Q. These are lipid soluble substances. So you can understand that the lipids within the plasma membrane are where these uh, enzymes can uh, can be found literally and they are involved in the electron transport system so they can accept and donate both electrons and protons and then we have the iron sulfur proteins now these iron sulfur proteins act as relays for the electrons so you can see different examples fe2s2 fe4s4 and a change in the reduction potential uh, will depend on the number of iron and sulfur atoms in these proteins and how many iron um, atoms are attached to these proteins. They are capable of accepting and donating only electrons, not protons. So these are uh, schematics to show you the different types of iron sulfur proteins. This electron transport chain is uh, applicable to prokaryotes only. In eukaryotes, the same process happens at the mitochondria, which is the site for oxidative phosphorylation. So, it's important to keep the definition of oxidative phosphorylation in mind. It's defined quite simply as the synthesis of ATP coupled with the electron transport chain. Now, it is important to remember that prokaryotes um, this electron transport process happens in prokaryotes at the plasma membrane and whether uh, the outside of the plasma membrane faces another outer membrane or whether it faces the cell wall, um, regardless the same process is happening. And in eukaryotes this process happens at the mitochondrial membrane. So that is at the inner membrane of the mitochondria and like I said this is the argument used in favor um, rather to um, explain the endosymbiotic theory so we will come back to this point later again. Uh, so that's about it over here and more of the same so if you want to look in terms of reduction potentials you can see how the reduction potential from complex 1 to 4 is going from negative E0 dash values to positive E0 dash values. So that is if you remember the electron tower this is similar to the electron tower and that tells you how the electrons that are um, available from NADH they are passing on all the way to the terminal electron acceptor and that is helping to generate proton motive force which in turn will be used for ATP generation. More of the same, so here you can see this is an even better schematic. So you can see the protons from the cytoplasm or from the mitochondrial matrix, they are being pumped out of the uh, mitochondria or the prokaryotic cell either way. So here we have the four complexes, you can see the generation of the proton motive force. You can see the four complexes, you can see the generation of the proton motive force and uh, the utilization of NADH. It gets converted to NAD+, which will go back to the glycolysis step and so on. And the same thing with FADH2, that will be converted to FAD+, and again, uh, it will be uh, sent back to the citric acid cycle. So here is the dissipation of the proton motive force and the generation of uh, ATP utilizing ADP. So this entire process is oxidative phosphorylation. 
Here we have an animation of ATP synthase and how it works in helping to use the proton motive force and uh, create ATP. So, um, the top part of the phospholipid bilayer is the inside of the cell and the bottom part is where the proton motive force is. So, these red uh, circles represent the protons and they are being taken in through ATP synthase within the cytoplasm you have ADP and along with a phosphate uh, these protons along with the uh, ADP molecules will be used to generate ATP using the phosphates. So, here we have the schematic representation of the ATP synthase enzyme. It is also called ATPase. It has uh, two regions, the F1 region and the F0 region. F1 comprises five different uh, polypeptide strands, so you can see them here and the F0 region has three polypeptide strands. Now, there is a subunit in the F0 region which will uh, pick up protons that have been uh, concentrating outside the membrane on the outer side of the membrane. Now, as these protons enter the membrane, uh, this um, ATP synthesis will happen on the other side. So, here you have ADP and ADP will be attached to a phosphate molecule and in that process the proton motive force will be utilized and ATP hydrolysis. So, basically water molecules are lost, ATP is uh, generated from the ADP molecules and that is how the entire thing happens. Now, there are two things from the environmental microbiology by a point of view, we have two compounds, two groups of compounds that are very important. One is inhibitors. These inhibitors are molecules or rather compounds that block the flow of electrons and the establishment of the proton motive force. So, you have carbon monoxide and cyanide. We know that both of them are toxic compounds. So, the way they act, the nature of their toxicity is to prevent the electron transport chain from proceeding they prevent PMF from being established and therefore ATP generation stops. Then we have uncouplers. Uncouplers are compounds that prevent ATP synthesis without impacting the electron transport chain. So, there are a couple of examples here. We have dinitrophenol and dicumerol. Then uh, here we have an example of ferment, uh, fermentation in E. coli. So, let us say we start with glucose, glucose is phosphorylated, it becomes a glucose 6-phosphate that is substrate level phosphorylation. This glucose 6-phosphate is converted to phosphoenol pyruvate. So, this phosphoenol pyruvate can be converted to oxaloacetate and uh, pyruvate can be converted to lactate. Now, phosphoenol pyruvate can be directly converted to oxaloacetate, malate, fumarate and succinate and this is an acidic form succinic acid. Pyruvate on the other hand will be converted to lactate or lactic acid, formate and formic acid and then that will further be converted to hydrogen and carbon dioxide, hydrogen gas. And then we have pyruvate being converted to acetyl-CoA and this acetyl-CoA can be converted to acetyl phosphate, acetaldehyde and the endpoints are acetate and ethanol. So, these are just examples of the fermentation end products of the same starting compound depending on the organism that is doing it. I have already given examples in the previous topic. So, like I said every different organism is going to generate different products depending on the starting compound and the um, nature of the organism. Now, in a nutshell, literally uh, to summarize all three processes, so three biochemical pathways, aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration and fermentation, these are our terminal electron acceptors. So, for aerobic respiration, it is oxygen. Phosphorylation happens by a combination of substrate level phosphorylation. So, this is substrate level phosphorylation and there is no other substrate level, uh, no other phosphorylation for fermentation. This is fermentation. In aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, you get both substrate level phosphorylation SLP and OP which is oxidative phosphorylation. 
we've already gone through the accounting where we saw that 38 ATP is the maximum number of ATP molecules that can be generated per molecule of glucose and this is for prokaryotes only. In anaerobic respiration, let me go to the next one which is fermentation. In fermentation, if you remember the glycolysis uh, process, only two ATP are generated directly and the remaining is NADH which has to go to the electron transport process. So in fermentation, you are left with only two ATP because that's the end point. There is no further um, generation of um, ATP because that reducing power which happens through the electron transport chain does not happen in the fermentation reaction. So in fermentation, you are left with only two ATP per mole of glucose. So two moles of ATP per mole of glucose. The terminal electron acceptor in this case as well as the electron donor is the same organic compound. So you have substrate level phosphorylation but no oxidative phosphorylation. Now in anaerobic respiration we are going to go into more details about these three pathways in the next topic. We will be doing a lot of quantification of all these compounds, how much energy is released, how, the, how do the bacteria utilize that energy and so on. So these are the possible terminal electron acceptors. We have Fe3, Mn4, sulfate, nitrate and so on. So SLP and OP, basically substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation will happen. 38 is our maximum, 2 is our minimum. So depending on the nature of the terminal electron acceptor, we will get a number between 2 and 38 for anaerobic respiration. Before we end this topic, we will do one more thing and that is to understand the efficiency of the uh, natural process. So 1 ATP we know is equivalent to 7.3 kilocalories per mole or 31.8 kilojoules per mole. Aerobic respiration uh, where we have already seen that the maximum ATP that you can generate from one mole of glucose is 38 ATP, right? 38 moles of ATP per mole of glucose. So if I multiply it, I've used kilocalories per mole, but it's better to use kilojoules per mole. So in terms of either kilocalories or in terms of kilojoules, this is what you get. So in terms of kilojoules per mole, you get 1208.4 kilojoules per mole of glucose or you can say 277.4 kilocalories per mole of glucose. Now what is the free energy of glucose, the free energy of formation of glucose? All right, so um, how much of the energy that is available from the complete oxidation of glucose is being trapped in the form of ATP? So here we have our uh, free energy of complete glucose oxidation. So if we write it as glucose plus oxygen going to CO2 plus water, our delta G0 for this reaction is minus 686 kilocalories per mole or minus 2881 kilojoules per mole. So we'll come to this question later. So let's take a look at the efficiency of ATP gen. What is nature's efficiency in generating 38 ATP from this available energy? So if this is what is available, how much is being utilized as ATP? So we get 40 point percent so that's pretty good from the nat from nature's perspective literally okay so we come to fermentation where glucose is converted to various end products so in this example the end product is lactate in this process two ATP are also formed so if I were to write the chemical reaction for one glucose going to two moles of lactate, then the delta G0 for that reaction is minus 558 kilojoules per mole. And uh, the two ATP that are formed can be accounted for. And what is the efficiency of energy transfer? So obviously the efficiency of energy transfer in terms of ATP only is very poor, it's close to 11%. I'll 
end this topic over here and we will look at other aspects of the energetics of microbial reactions in the next topic. Thank you.